I would like to do a review of Colonial Van Lines based on my recent move. This is my eighth move like this and the first time I've used Colonial Van Lines. I think I have used most of the other major moving companies. I would probably rank them somewhere between a complete train wreck and a dumpster fire. I'll talk a little bit about how each phase of the process went. I'm not entirely sure what they mean by binding quotes other than they found a way to put me in a real bind. The packing and loading at origin sort of leads to the unfinished job. Then the delivery window, delivery at destination, and finally litigation resolution. So you can see from these phases that it really went off the rails. So what are we moving? We moved from a five-bedroom, five-bathroom house with 3,800 square feet from Illinois to Texas. Let's now talk about the estimations and binding quotes. They use the term binding quote, which I find interesting once I look back at the entire process. This was the original quote that I got before I sold my home. I did not have a moving date since we did not have a contract on the house. The original estimate was $12,869.91, with an estimated move date around mid-October. Once we got a contract for the sale of my home, I called them back and let them know we would be moving at the end of November rather than mid-October. They said because of the holidays, the price went up. Sounds reasonable. I told them I needed to be out of the house on November 30th for December 1st closing. We'll come back to this date thing a little later. So the new quote was $13,675.88, which represents an $805.97 increase in price. Once we signed a contract on a home in Texas, there was a two-week gap before I could take possession, so they said I would have to go to storage at a cost of $3,271.36. They said the reason for the high cost is the need to unload and load again to and from storage. Again, sounds reasonable. When they finished with packing, they charged me $4,411.30. Because they said I had needed a lot more boxes than they estimated, the total difference was $1,537.80. There was also a $108 error that I found that they overcharged me due to a math error. So one of the big questions I had was, how could they be off by so much? Well, let's take a look at their estimates. This is a comprehensive list of items they developed as part of their estimation process. Sounds reasonable again, until you look a little deeper at the totals at the bottom. Let's take a look. The total boxes shows 279. When they were charging me an extra $1,500, one of the drivers told me they based the estimate on 150 boxes, and I actually used over 200. Hmm. Two other numbers we will talk about on this total summary is the 477 total items and the 25,011 pounds. This looks like a spreadsheet at the bottom of the list of items pages that calculates the cost of boxes. The number at the bottom matches the number in the quote. Then, just for fun, I typed all the information on this page into a spreadsheet and found that it only totaled 179 not the 279 in the bottom line summary on the previous page. Let's look at all the numbers in one place. The 279 estimated number was never used as part of the pricing estimate. It's a very round number, 100 difference between the estimated and quoted. So I'm not sure if they just shaved 100 boxes off to come in with a lower quote or if it was a typo. Either way, it looks like a mistake on their side. The actual pact was 231, which was 52 higher than quoted. One thing they emphasized to me repeatedly was that if I used more or less than the quoted number, the cost would go up or down. This leads me to believe it was intentionally understated. Let's next look at the weight. The estimated weight was 25,000, with the actual weight of 17,000, so they loaded 8,000 less weight than estimated. So now, let's look at the total number of items. They estimated 477 and actually loaded 420. So, they had 57 fewer items than estimated. All this starts to get really important here during the loading portion of my review. 
Let's now talk about the packing and loading. Sort of. They sent the packing and loading window of November 26th through November 29th. I questioned them at the time, reminding them that it was over the Thanksgiving holiday. They told me that they worked 365 days per year. I said, okay. I received a call at 4.30 p.m. on November 25th that they would not arrive until November 27th. I needed to be completely out of the house on November 29th in order to close on November 30th. I was told on November 28th that everything would not fit in the truck and I needed to decide what was not moving. What? They simply just dumped their problem in my lap the day before I needed to be out of the house. When they showed up at my house, they showed up with the truck pictured on the bottom. I specifically asked them about the truck since they said I would have exclusive use of it and there should be no problem fitting everything. I also got a quote for two men and a truck and had a similar discussion. They told me it was going to take four trucks since they use a smaller kind of truck. At the end of the day, I don't really care what kind of truck they bring as long as everything fits. When they finally told me everything was not going to fit on the truck, they immediately blamed it on me and said I must have more stuff than the estimate. When I told them they should have brought a bigger truck like the one pictured above and on their websites, they told me there was no difference in capacity. That was an interesting discussion. You can see from the picture, there is clearly a difference in size. Here's a picture from the Kentucky Trailer website that talks about drop frame trailers typically used by commercial moving companies in all seven of my previous moves. They state on this page that you get 20% to 40% more capacity. You can clearly see from the picture that you get more space with the lower floor. Normal semi-trailers floors are at the top of those white boxes over the wheel wells. So, Saturday afternoon, they just pulled out and left a lot of stuff behind. Here's a video that I took after their truck left. This is all the stuff that I had to figure out something to do with it. They moved a bunch of things to the garage, and most of the boxes you see were from our last move. So, I called U-Haul, and they were able to help find a truck. Availability was limited, but they were able to find a truck for me that was 60 miles away. So, my wife and I drove over on Sunday morning, picked up the truck, and started loading all the remaining items. You can see from the picture on the right that I did not do a very efficient packing job. I was just trying to get everything loaded as quickly as possible. So I had to call around and find a storage unit in Texas to put everything for two weeks. So we drove 12 to 14 hours from Illinois to Texas, then unloaded it the next day. Let's talk about the delivery window. The delivery window in Texas was set for December 14th through December 21st. 
I called every day the week before, as well as the week of the delivery window, to get updates on when they would deliver. I think I finally got an answer on the 18th that they were going to deliver on the 21st, which was one day outside the delivery window. Now, let's talk about the delivery at the destination. One of the people I was talking to at Colonial Van Lines was trying to blame everything on the drivers, saying they must not have packed it efficiently. We had many debates about the size of the truck, where they were simply more interested in blaming it on either me or the drivers. So I took this picture that shows a false floor. I suspect this is where they store their equipment, such as ramps, dollies, and whatever else. You can clearly see the capacity is reduced on the inside. So, how did they handle the items they did move? This is an armoire whose legs and base did not survive. Their first response to me was that it was fine when they put it on the truck. I'm not sure what happened, but I pointed out to them that something happened to it on the driveway because there are broken pieces of it all over the driveway. So, rather than explain how the claims process works, they said I could just take the bottom off and just use it like that. More broken handles. I found lots of broken handles with a pile of broken handle pieces sitting in one of the window sills. More broken handles. Here was a broken leg on one of the sectional sofa pieces. What was most disturbing is that they did not tell me about any of this. I had to discover it all on my own. The same thing happened on the loading end. Unfortunately, my buyer pointed several things out that the movers damaged as he was doing his final walkthrough on the day of closing. So now, we get to the fun part. I made a list of my expenses for cleaning up their mess and handling the items they left behind. So, where do we go from here? I'm in the process of filing a lawsuit in small claims court. I will also follow up with another YouTube video on the steps I took to file the lawsuit as well as the outcome. Bottom line? Worst moving company by far I have ever dealt with. Would definitely not recommend. This is the first time out of eight moves where they had issues with fitting everything. We actually downsized in our move two years ago, so there were less things to move than last time. Thanks for watching. Like and share this video. Would love to read your comments below. See you on the next video of how to file a lawsuit against Colonial Van Lines. If you already have made the mistake of using them, it may come in handy.